in your Bibles, we're going to launch actually from Matthew 1, 22 through 23, uh, but we're going to go uh, to a lot of things. I want to welcome uh, Cooper back from TCU, to Cooper Bradbury. He's just finished all his uh, grades and uh, finals and stuff, and he's down there in Texas. I said, well, is Texas your home? He says, yep, that's where my home is, and he was quickly corrected by his mother who says, no, your home is where your mother is. <laughs> So that's right, Megan. Uh, when Megan speaks, we all listen. For those of you who don't know, Megan is the administrative assistant to the church. She really runs the place. We just sort of try to keep up. So anyway, glad you're here today. And uh, before we launch, let's just pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of your word. Uh, we thank you for friends. And we thank you, Lord, for yourself. And Lord, what a wonderful time of year we can stop and particularly focus on your entry into the world. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for revealing to us the truth. In these next few moments, Lord, would you open our ears and our hearts to hear what your spirit is saying to us, and we give you praise for that in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23 begins this way. It says, and this is right in the passage we discussed last week, it said, now all this took place, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated means God with us. What I want to talk to you today is about the Old Testament prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ. Today there is somewhat of a movement to in some ways diminish the importance of the Old Testament. I believe scripture itself declares very strongly that the Bible from Genesis through to Revelation is the word of God, has equal weight and authority. If the enemy can undermine even the first part of Genesis or any part of the Bible, the integrity of the whole thing falls apart. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I need to turn my little gizmo on here, um, verses uh, 16 and 17. This is the last book that Paul wrote, and he said, All scripture is inspired by God. Now, we believe that what is written, Old Testament, New Testament, is from God. So he says, all Scripture. Now, when Paul wrote this, there was no New Testament. So when he says all Scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures in those times. All Scripture is inspired by God. And this is in the New Living Translation, so it's different than what some of you might no, it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do and what is right, to do what is right. And it goes on, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now that's Paul's commentary. This is the last book that he wrote. And he was reminding Timothy, keep your hope strong in the written word of God. Because that is the authority for your lives. And Peter, the primary or number one follower of Jesus Christ, also in his last letter <clears throat> that we have recorded in the Bible, he recounts the time when he actually heard the voice of God out of heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration. Can you imagine hearing the booming voice of God? I think it sounds like thunder, perhaps. And he says, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transformed. In reflecting upon that, he says, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. He goes on, verse 20. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. It wasn't like men said, well, I'm going to creatively put down what I think God says. 
No, these prophets and the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament wrote down what God said. It was almost like it was dictation. But perhaps it wasn't as that direct. But nonetheless, they were confident it wasn't coming from their own thinking. In fact, in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, says that they studied their own writings. So they'd write them down, then go back and study what you wrote. To see what God was saying. Verse 21, nor was it from human initiative. They didn't come up with the idea. This was God. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. So that's what we want to talk about. Several verses from the Old Testament today, which has the credibility, the same credibility as the New Testament, as we look at some of the prophecies of Jesus Christ, most specifically of his birth. John's testimony. Well, why do we need to study the word of God? Jesus in his prayer in John 17 said, Lord, sanctify them. Make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. I believe when we study the word of God, when you memorize it, meditate on it, it makes you holy. It transforms you from the inside out. He goes on and John, why is it so important to know the word of God? Because the word is the truth. And truth is under attack today. A lot of people don't know what truth is. Well, what is true? It goes back to Pilate's statement. Well, what is truth? John 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, now listen to this, continue in my word, there is many believers today, you are being tempted by your busyness, Many other things do not continue in the Word of God. I believe the older we become in Christ, the more necessary it is to eat more from the Word of God. You think you'd need it as a little baby. You need it. Yes, you do. You, you actually drink a lot of milk when you're a baby. That's pre-digested food. But as you get older in the Lord, you eat more. And the good news is, no calories. Glory to God. Doesn't go to the wrong places, seems like. In fact, I feel like I'm having to eat less and I'm still growing more. You anyone feel that way sometimes? Amen. <laughs> Go down here. So he goes on. He says, why do I need to continue in the word of God? He says, so that you would know the truth. And listen to this. The truth will make you what? Free. Liberty. The free to make the right choices. You're not driven by sin. You're not captivated by this world that's making you conform to it. It's leading you to consequences that you don't often want to experience. There's a way out. There's a way of freedom. And it's knowing the word of God and the truth of God. It'll make you free. It'll make you free. There's some evidences, by the way, of someone who's not in the word of God. And, and one thing the Lord's really been convicting me about lately, I had a terrible dream this morning. I was telling some brothers about it. I'm not going to go into it. I realized once in a while we've got to control anger. And one evidence that you're not really walking with God is the fact of recurring anger. And if that's it, I want you to bring it before the Lord. It says, Lord, you need to remove this from me. And I tell you, go into the Word of God. Anger, anxiety, some of these things, they're symptoms of not always being in the Word of God. And I remember in the beginning of the Bible, the very first Bible I got, my dad wrote this. He says, the devil will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from the devil. And I want to tell you, that's a good word. Because the devil wants to get into your life, he wants to deceive you. He wants to lie to you. He wants to tell you that you're going the wrong way. But trust the word of God. Trust God. It's most important. I'm leaning heavily this morning, uh, sort of, I want to give credit where credit's due, uh, on a book called New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Now, if you're a person or you know someone that's struggling with the truth of God's word, there's just too many contradictions. This, I believe, is one of the most uh, well-written books I think on the market. Are you all familiar with this? You college students haven't seen this here? Josh McDowell, you're familiar with him. Josh McDowell was a, a young man who was studying to be an attorney. And he was an agnostic. In fact, he set out to prove this whole idea of religion and Jesus Christ wasn't true. But guess what? In his search, and this happens many times, he was converted to Jesus Christ. He joined a movement called Campus Crusade for Christ. And as a result, he got a bunch of college students, and, as well as his own, and he's done this research, and it's, uh, it's titled uh, 
fully, um, it says, to answer the questions challenging Christians in the 21st century. So I excerpted a lot of this. If you want to get more information uh, from what I'm saying today, that's a good book. And I used him as sort of a bounce-off thing. Josh McDowell is a wonderful speaker. Boy, has he made an impact around the world. You do some research on him. Very, very powerful uh, man of God that God is using uh, in this uh, time period. Uh, just done an amazing thing in terms of helping young people be pure and uh, speaking the truth. So I want to just go through and give you some foundations for the truth today, particularly who Jesus is. When you're finished here, I hope you are more and more in love with Jesus and you know who he is. So there's two foundations for the Messiahship of Christ. How do we know that Jesus is the one? We're going to talk about that in a moment. The Messiah, the one. First of all, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no other person, no other spiritual leader that's ever claimed to be resurrected physically from the dead. There's now a new movement and some new information. Supposedly Muhammad was uh, resurrected and taken up into heaven, but the truth matter, there is no resurrection of Muhammad. There is only resurrection of Jesus Christ, physically proven. That's how you know he is the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one. And then there's the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus Christ. There's nearly 300 prophecies about the coming of Christ, about Christ and who he is, found in the Old Testament. Very specifically, there is 61 that have been identified. Today, I'm only going to be talking about eight of them, just eight. And, uh, you know, we think about the matrix, you know, and, and I want to tell you the one is not Kenu Reeves. I just want to give you that revelation today. The one, the, the one who's going to come to bring salvation to this world is Jesus Christ. I want to make it very clear today that Jesus Christ is not just the Jewish Messiah. He is the Messiah for the whole world. He's the Messiah for the Australians. He's the Messiah for the Americans. He's the Messiah for the, the, the Europeans and the Africans. He's the Messiah for everybody. One day when he comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the coming one. This book is the only book in all of history that tells you how history began and it tells you how history is going to end. And it's going to end with Jesus Christ being Lord above all. So these prophecies, how does God talk to his people? How does he talk to us? I venture to say there's not one person in this room has heard, well I could be wrong, but have heard the audible voice of God. I heard one person say, he says, if you heard the audible voice of God, it would scare you so badly. You'd say, please don't ever let that happen again. Because the voice of God is very, very powerful. So God in his greatness really talks directly to individuals, although there are certain ones he does talk to. God's pattern of communication, God reveals himself and his message to his prophets. A prophet is a person who has the ability to hear the voice of God and then to speak it forth to other people on behalf of God. To prophesy, the word literally means to speak forth. In other words, for instance, if Roger down here said to me, Philip, I have a message that you need to give to my wife. I'd say, what is that? He would tell me, whisper it in my ear, and he says, my wife is the most beautiful person I know, and I love her deeply. Would you pass it on? I'd go over, Renee, you know what Roger says about you? He says, you're the most beautiful woman, and he loves you a whole lot. I just became Roger's prophet. I took his message from him to the person that he wanted it delivered to. God in his wisdom over the years has chosen men and women who he has given his word and then sends them now. Go tell those people what I've said. Moses was a prophet, was he not? Isaiah was a prophet. Jeremiah, we can go on. Samuel was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. Can I tell you, Paul had the gift of prophecy. Anyone who wrote scripture was prophetic and had the gift of prophecy. Let me show you a couple of scriptures that support that. And uh, I'll just put them up there. I may not have time to go through all of them, but we'll look at a few of them here. Isaiah 48, I had to bring my big Bible today. Oftentimes I just preach out of the New Testament, so I've got my big one here just to let you know. I do, do read the whole Bible here. So uh, Isaiah 48, and I'm going to just look it up like I'm normally. Sometimes I have my electronic device, you know. I can't find it quick as, as quick as I can by just looking it up here. So 
Bear with me, Isaiah 48. I don't have my little markers in here. So Isaiah, in Australia we call this Isaiah. So there you go, you can speak in another language. Three and five, I declare the former things. This is God speaking and, and Isaiah's writing it down. I declare the former things long ago. They went forth from my mouth and I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted and they came to pass. Verse five, therefore I declared them to you long ago. Before they took place, I proclaimed them to you, lest you should say, my idol has done them. My graven image and my molten image has commanded them. This is the beautiful thing about the word of God. God speaks it to his prophets and then he, he does it later on. We know what God's going to do. Looking in Romans, this is the Apostle Paul writing in the book of Romans, the first book listed that, that uh, Paul writes in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1. And uh, verse 1 and 2, uh, he begins, he begins the same way. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. See, he speaks things. They're putting in the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of things in the Word of God that God's prophesied that has not yet happened. Yet, it's going to happen. It's all in the Word of God. And there's so many things that God has prophesied, that he's spoken through his prophets, that are starting to happen today. That, uh, you know, when we, that's why that's a very interesting subject, and perhaps we might look at that in the new year. And then you look at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Uh, it's interesting how Jesus confirmed who he is, who he was to his disciples. Luke 24, and looking at verse 27 says, and beginning with Moses, now this is in the Old Testament, beginning with Moses, and Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua. Oh, Deuteronomy, just wanted to see if you're all listening. And uh, said, verse 27, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. You see, guys? It's all there. And you look down here in verse 44 of the same chapter. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Here's all the things about me. It's in the Old Testament. I want to tell you, look at that. You see, guys, this has happened. I am the Messiah. I am the one. I am the one. And then how about Revelation? Some of the things that have not yet happened. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. And I'm going to take you then to the last verse. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Now listen carefully. The things which must shortly take place, he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. That makes John a what? John was a prophet. You're good. You're good. You're getting it. That's right. John was a prophet, and he's written a whole bunch of stuff written here in the book of Revelation. Could I tell you from my own study of the Word of God, a lot of this is not, in fact, most of it's not even happened yet. But when it starts happening, you can say, oh, I know what's going to come next. You can look there at tomorrow's news. It's all right there. Look at chapter 22. I'll put that up there for you. Uh, chapter 22, which is the last uh, chapter in the Bible. Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 6. He says this, now listen carefully. He said to me, these words are faithful and true. These words are faithful, you can trust them. Are faithful and true And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. When you read the book of Revelation, don't be afraid. But it'll tell you what's coming up. Some of it's scary. And a lot of it is very, very exciting for us. It's going to happen. Everything written in this book is absolutely true. It's faithful and true. You've got to believe all of this. Genesis through to Revelation, or don't believe any of it. You really have nothing, no middle ground, folks. No middle ground. And yet there's a movement today that suggests there is middle ground. Some of it's good, some of it's not. You can't do that. You cannot do that. It undermines the integrity of the whole thing. This book itself, and I wish I could take another message, maybe I shouldn't tell you the formation of this book. I've studied most specifically the New Testament. That's my major. That was what I did in my uh, master's thesis and so forth. 
I tell you, the formation of this is amazing, and the integrity of it is amazing, and the fact that God has preserved it. Look at this, still the number one bestseller all around the world. The book that everybody's searching for, particularly the countries where it doesn't exist. Dear American friends, why are we not in it every day, passionately studying the Word of God, because in it are the treasures of God. The treasures of God that bring stability in your life, and confidence, and hope, and excitement, the things you and I so desperately crave for. So let's look at these eight prophecies there. Oh, I'll just give you a couple other points here. There's only two Gospels that record the details of Jesus' birth. There's Matthew. He was a Jewish tax collector. Matthew is a book written by a Jew about a Jew for Jews. You got that? Then we have Luke, and he was a Gentile. He's like you all. I don't think there's any Jews here. Anybody a Jew? Put your hand up. Okay. Oh, a bunch of Gentiles. It's not a bad, it's not a bad thing. It's not like a bunch of sinners. You may be one of those too, but he's a Gentile doctor. That means he's a scientist. He's a man of science. And he says right at the beginning of his book, I've researched this very carefully. I'm not writing something that's just mm, hearsay. I've researched this. I've interviewed everybody. And he was close enough to be able to do it. It's interesting in both Matthew and Luke, there's a genealogy. It starts off with Matthew. And Matthew starts with an interesting person. Does anyone know who is the first Jew? Abraham, right down here. So when he starts off, he goes from Abraham all the way through to the father of Jesus. And then, however, Luke, he starts with supposedly the father of Jesus, which was Joseph, supposedly, because he wasn't. And it goes all the way back to Adam, because Luke wanted to show how Jesus was part of the human race. It's interesting, by the way, when you look at those genealogies, we believe Luke's genealogy is the genealogy of Mary. And Matthew's genealogy is the genealogy of Joseph. Guess who they're both descended from? David. Both are from David. You realize that both of them would have been a prince and a princess. If the kingly line had come all the way down, which means Jesus would have been a prince. He indeed was a king. Well, let's go to the specific prophecies here. I got eight, so I think we can do that. At least I'm not doing 61. You'd really be scared, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh my gosh, doing a seminar. Uh, okay, number one. The first one we find in the word of God is Jesus will be born of the seed of a woman. Now the one thing the Jews totally missed about their Messiah is that he was coming as a baby. They did not get that. See, in the Old Testament, there are the prophecies of the coming of their Messiah as a great ruling king and conqueror. And then they were scattered throughout all these little hints about a baby. They're like, doesn't make sense. In other words, when you look at a forest, you see the front trees and you see the trees behind. But you don't know how close they are. Because you're looking. And so the first coming and the second coming of Jesus, the prophets could see it in the future but they oftentimes couldn't make a distinction from the first coming and the second coming. And that's why we're so blessed that we live in this age that we know about the first coming and we're anticipating the second coming. This is not a mystery in many ways. We have a revelation of it. It's been uncovered. The question is, do you believe it? That's the question. So we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis, and you can trust the book of Genesis. Might I say, Genesis was not written to be a scientific document. It was written to be a spiritual one. Revelation, a theological one. Rev Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Lord was giving his judgments, and he spoke to the woman. He says in verse 15, I'm sorry, the Lord began to speak to the serpent, who was to Satan. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now, you, you realize the word seed has to do with the egg of a woman and the sperm of a man. So, he's saying, I'm going to put enmity between your seed, Satan, and you're going to produce kids, the wrong kind of kids, and she's going to produce this incredible person from her 
seed from her womb. He shall bruise you on your head. He's taking you out, dude. It's kind of, that's a Phillips translation. And, uh, and you shall bruise him on his heel. You, you'll get a, a shot at him on the cross, but don't worry. He's coming back, and he will go like this, and you're done. He's going to take you out. That's the first prophecy we have in the Word of God about the coming of Christ. And we see then in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, that that is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. So you move over here to Matthew chapter 1. You see, I should have my little spots marked somewhere here. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Gives you a chance to think about all this stuff. 1 verse 20. And when he had considered this, behold, an angel appeared to Joseph, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The second prophecy we see in the Word of God is that she will be, he will be born of a virgin. Born of a virgin. Now you see this in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. By the way, Isaiah was written 700 years before the coming of Christ. 700 years. Look at this, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will, uh, I'm sorry, yes, will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name, what? Emmanuel. God with us. Now, what is interesting about this, and we see this certainly fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. In fact, that very verse is quoted by Matthew under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And Matthew's good at quoting the Old Testament. And he quotes that in that, which I read earlier for you, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now listen, before they came together, before they came together, she was a virgin. She had not had sexual uh, intimacy uh, because they were just betrothed. They were not yet married. And then we go to verse 24 and 25. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord had commanded and took her as his wife. Now verse 25, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. It's interesting in the construction of verse 25, and kept her as a virgin. In other words, did not know her as his wife until after she'd given birth to Jesus. So is it possible that Mary had children with Joseph after the birth of Jesus? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. In fact, they listed four of them, four sons we know, and then just says sisters. Sorry, ladies, but that's the way it's written in the Word of God. But it's interesting that in the Hebrew, and the Hebrew, by the way, is much more challenging than the Greek I've studied both. And if you've ever seen Hebrew, you know Hebrew? When you read the Hebrew Bible, you know how it starts? Back here. You open up to chapter 1 in Genesis, and it's right back here. And they read backwards. I mean, it, in fact, they say, my Hebrew professor says, no, they read right way. We're all backwards. So it just depends on how you look at it. And I, had, I took Hebrew for one year, and I, the only way I got through it was because this, this professor was so excited about Hebrew he helped us get A's. I don't know. He just his enthusiasm was so great, and so. Uh, but nonetheless, it's interesting. There's two types of words used in the Hebrew language for the word virgin. There is Bethula. Bethula simply means a virgin maiden. That's a young lady who's got not marriageable age yet. She's just a young lady who is a virgin who's never had sexual intimacy appropriately. So, but there's a second word, Alma. This is a virgin of marriageable age, combining the idea of virginity, but of an old enough to be married. And this is the word that's used in Isaiah 7 verse 14, which stating that Jesus would be born of a virgin of marriageable age. Very specific, don't you think? It's kind of fascinating. So that's the second one. The third one 
is that Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah. So we go all the way back to Genesis again. This is the first book. Does anyone know what the word Genesis means? It means beginnings. Very good. You're all good students. So uh, we go back to the last, I think the, almost the last chapter in the book of Genesis, verse 49 and verse 10 says, the scepter, now this is when Jacob is prophesying as a father did to all of his sons. He had 12 of them, so it took a while to say the least. And he had a lot to say to his son named Judah. Listen to this, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. What's the word Shiloh mean? Does anyone know? It means peace. Shiloh. And Jesus is also named in the book of Isaiah as the prince of peace. Shiloh is a prediction of the coming of Christ. Until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Everybody on the earth is going to obey this guy. And he's going to come from you, Judah. And Judah's probably sitting there thinking, wow. <laughs> one of my kids way down the road is going to be the ruler of the whole world. He's absolutely right. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah. Okay, are we moving along okay? Okay, next, number four. He's going to come, and not only from the tribe of Judah, but from the house of David. Let's go to Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah is a big, big book. There's major prophets and minor prophets. You know why they're major? Nothing to do with rank. They're just bigger. That's all it is. Bigger prophets are major. Minor prophets are littler. That's all it is. And then uh, chapter 23 and verse 5. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Again, uh, soon after Isaiah, about seven, 650 years before Jesus appeared on the earth. Do you realize Jesus has always existed? Never had a beginning because he's God. God's uncreated, always existed, had no beginning. He's the Alpha and the Omega from beginning to end. And that's a little challenging for us. 23 verse 5 reads this way, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, Israel will dwell securely, and this is is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Can I tell you, dear friends, that's not happened yet. He is not yet ruling on the earth. The Bible predicts the day will come. He will rule on the earth. And guess where he will rule from? Most likely Jerusalem. Right in that center place. The place where there's so much turmoil. No coincidence there, folks. We go into that. From the house of David. And both, as I said earlier, Mary and Joseph were descended from the house of uh, David. You see in, in Luke chapter 2 verse 4, you remember that Joseph was living in Nazareth and he had to because a Caesar, Augustus, wanted them to go back to their place of their origin and he had to go back to what city? Bethlehem. Why did he have to go back to Bethlehem? Because it was the city of David. Very good. See, good scholars. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. So we've got four so far. Four prophecies. Did Jesus have anything to do with these prophecies? Could he have manipulated this and directed Mary, go back to Jerusalem, go back to Bethlehem, and, you know, just led from inside the tummy? I don't think it's possible. He's pretty good, but I don't think he did that. How about this? Not only in the house of David, but born in Bethlehem. Now, there's a specific prophecy. Now you go to Micah. Micah is one of the minor prophets, which means he's very hard to find in the back end of the, the Old Testament. But I'm just lucky today because here it is. Matt, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now, this is about 400 years, 450 years before Jesus came. Listen to this. How about that? I was born in Adelaide. I don't think anybody predicted that, which is okay. But Jesus was predicted in Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. For you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forths are from long ago. Listen to this, from the days of eternity. Is that Jesus? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Wow. 
born in Bethlehem. What are the chances? Well, I don't need to go to Matthew chapter 2. You know it's all about Bethlehem. How about number 6? Presented with gifts. Presented with gifts. Did you know that's in the Old Testament too? Let's go to in Psalms. Who wrote most of the Psalms? Does anybody know? David. This was his journal, and he wrote a lot of them. But it wasn't just David. This one possibly was written by Solomon. Solomon wrote several of the Psalms as well. Psalm 72, and uh, we start with verse 10. Let the kings of Tarshish and of the islands bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. And let all kings bow down before him. All the nations serve him. You see what it's talking about? This one that's going to be served by all the nations. Dear friends, Jesus is not yet served by all the nations. But the day is coming when he will be served by all the nations. But he'll be given gifts. And they're from kings from the east. By the way, I won't get into all of this. I don't know if I'll preach on it or not. But you realize that these kings or these wise men, by the way, we don't know how many there were. They might have been just two. They might have been ten. We just, why do we think there's three? Because there was three gifts. That's right. And so these guys could have been descendants, at least as disciples, of Daniel, who probably taught them about what was coming in the future and trained these men. And if it, they weren't directly from Daniel, maybe two or three generations down from the school of Daniel. And so they were looking for this Messiah. And they were looking somehow as astrologers for the star. And they brought gifts. And you see that in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. We've already looked at that earlier as Harvey did that. Let's go to number 7. How about this flight to Egypt? This is found in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. That's another one of those minor prophets which you have to scour in the back here to find where on earth is Hosea. Here we go. Hosea, by the way, is a wonderful book. We won't get into that. 11 verse 1. Hosea 11 verse 1. It says, When Israel was a youth I loved him, and out of Jesus, out of Jesus, out of Egypt, I called my son. And you look at that, and you go then over to Matthew chapter, I've got to move to my next thing here, don't I? Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 15, and you have the wise men bringing gifts to Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, 13 and 15. I'm going to move on from there. Oh, I, gotta, I, I need to tell that story. You know what happened? The uh, wise men have brought the gifts, uh, but then this flight to Egypt. Well, how did that happen? Well, in a dream, God came to uh, Joseph and told him, Herod's really mad. Now, I want to tell you something interesting uh, before I get to all of this. Here in chapter 2, Herod met with the wise men because remember the wise men came to uh, the king, and said, we want to know where this king of the Jews is. Well, Herod's a crazy man. He is very, very paranoid. He scared another king, and he got very suspicious. So he said, you go find him, and when you find him, you let me know, and come back and tell, tell me where he is so I can worship him. What was that? A lie. All right? He had, he had a funny way of wanting to worship him. And then he goes on, and they didn't come back because in a dream... But God said, don't go back to Herod. So what does Herod do? He says, he goes, checks with the brilliant brains and the theological leaders of the time. And let's look at verse 4 of Matthew chapter 2. And gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he began to inquire of them, where was Christ to be born? Now you need to understand the coming of Christ was a big focal point of that time. Just as today in a lot of ways, don't you think the second coming of Christ is a pretty exciting study? I mean, it's fun to think about, wow, Jesus is coming and, and how he's going to wrap up history. That's a very exciting. Well, you've got to realize in this time, they studied that. So all these verses that I've shown you today, they were really familiar with. I'll show you. Because he said to these people, weren't ever going to be believers in Jesus. Look what happens. And they said to him, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, it has been written by the prophet. So they knew about Bethlehem. So what happened? Good old Herod says, well, I know what I'll do about that. How old do you think he is? Well, he's probably less than two. I'm going to send some people down there. Some of my men would just take out all these little babies. Less than two, I'm sure to knock out this king of the Jews. Well, God has a way of talking to Joseph. Aren't we glad about that? Has dreams, has these dreams. And he says, get up right now. 
take your wife and your baby and go where? Down to Egypt. And so he gets up and takes them. And look at this, verse 15. And uh, I'm sorry, verse 14. He arose and took the child and his mother by night, departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. Out of Egypt. So there it is. And then, and this is a really sad one. Do you know that's prophesied? Herod went down there and slaughtered babies in Bethlehem. And can you imagine having that happen? And there's nothing, ladies, you could do. As Herod's soldiers came in and ripped your less than two-year-old child out of your arms and slaughtered it right in front of you. And you know that's prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at all these. These are just eight prophecies. Eight of 61 specific ones. Uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse uh, 15. Follow with me here. Uh, I realize this is hard work on your brains, but you're doing really good. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Uh, Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. It's a terrible, and it was prophesied there, and you see in Matthew chapter 2, 16 through 18, that's exactly happened. Now, there's a lot of people says, yeah, but come on, you know, yeah. You know anybody like that? Ah, yeah, I can't believe that stuff. Well, let's just take some of the skeptical objections. And again, the, the book does a wonderful job with this. The, there's been fulfilled prophecies were engineered by Jesus. He read the Bible, and then he decided, oh, I can do this stuff. And so he lined himself up with these prophecies so it looked like he was fulfilling them. Does that, you understand what I'm saying? That makes sense? But let's ask the question, as I proposed earlier. How about the birth narratives? Do you think he could have figured that out? Matched all those things? Pretty unlikely. Number two. Well, it just happened to be coincidental. It was accidental. Now, we've considered just eight prophecies here this morning. So, let's think about that for a moment. And if you had eight prophecies fulfilled, you know the probability of that? One in ten to the 17th power. One in, the, you can see the number there, 17 zeros. That's pretty improbable. Would you agree with me? All right. I know some of you are still not convinced. Let me read some more. Now, I'm going to quote here a little bit. H. Harold Hartzler of the American Scientific Affiliation, Goshen College, wrote about a book, and this is in the preface of Peter Stoner's book called Science Speaks. He says, we've evaluated it, the American Scientific Affiliation members, and by the executive council of the same group, have been found in general to be dependable and accurate in record to the scientific material presented. So the mathematical analysis included is based upon principles of probability which are thoroughly sound, and Professor Stoner has applied these principles in a proper and convincing way. Professor Stoner is the one who came up with this probability. For just eight prophecies to happen is so inconceivable, it is literally impossible. Now, one in 10 to the 17th power. Would you like me to try to explain that to you? Here we go. I did this for Cooper, the great state of Texas up there. So Cooper, I just wanted you to feel welcome back here. There's Texas. All right, so that's good. Now, let, let me explain here how that works. It, to try to visualize this, it would be, um, is where uh, you would take um, this 10 to the 17th power, uh, silver dollars. That's a lot of money, folks. And you're to take it, and you're to spread it out all over the face of Texas. That's a lot of silver dollars spread over there that cover all the state two feet deep. Are you with me? Two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole thing up thoroughly all over the state. Now you need to blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes in this great state of Texas. And he's got to find that one silver dollar that's got a mark on it. What's the chances, Cooper? Pretty slim. Pretty slim, in spite of those intelligent Texans. That's just eight prophecies to be fulfilled by one man 
over that period of time in that distance. Wow, that's scientific. That is amazing. Okay, there we go, let Texas go. Last thing, yeah, but you know, there's other psychics. Nostradamus, some of these other guys, haven't they predicted things that have really happened? Well, I want to tell you, Nostradamus has got a poor track record. In the word of God in Deuteronomy 18, 20 and 22, it says this, if there's a prophet who makes a prophecy and it does not come to pass, can you tell me what happens to them? They are executed because they are known as a what? A false prophet. They are not telling the truth. They're misleading. And if you get two or three prophecies right and three or four wrong, guess what? That nullifies the two or three that you might have got right. So therefore, every psychic <laughs> is considered by biblical standards. Now listen to this. A study of psychic prophecies between 1975 and 1981 of the 72 predictions, six of them were fulfilled. Such great prophecies like, hmm, Russia and America will be great powers. Okay, well, that's good. That's really good. And there was one other that I can't remember exactly what it is. Six. So all of these psychics, at least from a biblical perspective, in contrast, the biblical prophets are all false. Are all false. The only way you accurately know the future is by the revelation of God. Is this book true? You've got to wrestle with that. Is this book true? Every, every word? I want to finish with simply this. The titles and the names of Jesus. There's three. And this is it. First one is Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. This is his title. Number two, Emmanuel, God with us. That's who Jesus is. He's God with us. He's God with us. When you've accepted Jesus Christ, Emmanuel comes with you. And by the way, that's not just like, oh, I believe in Jesus and I believe all this stuff. No, no, no. You have relationship with him. He is with you. In 1970, I sat in a history class. I sat in the back. And there was a young lady who sat down the front. Her name was Kathy Leeson. I was quiet. She was loud. <laughs> Except the crazy history professor kept asking me questions. Now, how does this compare to Australia? I said, I have no idea. I knew about her. But I, she was not with me. I believed in her. I saw her. I actually visually saw her. But she was not with me. And then 10 years later, this young lady came to the church where I was ministering. She had a white dress on. I remember that. And don't, right? You can't remember that? It was that woolly one. But I won't go into that. A woolly one. It was winter. I just finished, by the way, counseling her boyfriend. Wouldn't you know it? <clears throat> you kind of know how my counsel went, right? <laughs> he actually accepted Christ. And she was... And then later, two years later or so, I have come to know Kathy. In some ways, Emmanuel, you know? She is Kathy with me. We entered into oneness that's what it means. It's not going to church. It's not just having knowledge of the scriptures. It is having relationship with Jesus Christ, which leads us to this last one, Jesus. This name. It's a very precious name. Kathy is a very precious name to me. But this name is more important to me. You know what the word Jesus means? Savior. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. When you've accepted Jesus, when Jesus comes into your life, he saves you from your sins. Your sins no longer dictate what you do. Your sins no longer force your anxieties. Your sins no longer force your anger. Your sins no longer force your guilt. You're guilt-free. I hope some of you have been reading the book of Leviticus. Hasn't it been wonderful how we can be free from guilt and totally forgiven? Lay in our hands. We don't have to lay our hands on any animal, even birds, or bring any flower. Jesus says, I've got that part covered. But you do need to confess your sins. 
You did need to receive my forgiveness and receive me as your animal. I'm your substitute. And when you're free from sins, it's awesome. It is awesome. Worship team, come on up. Let me tell you a little bit more about this name. This name, the person who came to the earth. His name is Jesus. And Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we may be saved. What's the name? The name is Jesus. It's not Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. The first part, Jesus is Savior. Is he your Savior? That's what you've got to ask the question. Is he my Savior? This is my wife. He is my Savior. You understand the comparison there. And let me give you one other thing. I want to tell you, this is for the future. Listen to this. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now listen to this. For this reason, God, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Every name. Jesus is above every name. Buddha, it is a name. It is above Muhammad. It is above every name. There is no comparison to the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It goes on. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. No other person in history has that, that prophetic word. Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All three levels. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Jesus who came to this earth as a little baby. This is the Jesus who come back one day as a glorified God. Are you ready? And that's the thing we need to ask. Are you ready for that to happen? Why don't you stand to your feet? Stand to your feet. And I want to say to you today, do you believe Jesus? Do you believe in this book? He is the Word of God and He's lined up with this book. To believe in Jesus, you must believe in this book. And to believe in this book, believe this book points you to Jesus. This book is not Jesus. Do not worship the book. But this book certainly points you to Jesus. To love Jesus is to love the book. There is no separation between the two. So Lord, we just come before you and say, Lord, fill us with your spirit. For those, Lord, in this room who struggle with unbelief, who struggle with what is truth, Lord, would you pour truth into them today? Give them a fresh revelation of Jesus and who he is, Lord. We accept who you are. We look forward to your coming. I tell you, if there's anyone in this room that as we sing this, what child is this? And you say, I just want to recommit my life. Or maybe for the first time in your life, you says, I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to learn how to be a follower of his. I want to be joined together with him. Well, you can come right where you're at. You can say, yes, Lord, I accept you. I dedicate my life to you. I accept who you are. If you would like prayer for any other reason, you're welcome to come and just sit. And at the conclusion of the service, we'll, we'd love to pray with you. So that's the invitation. It's open to you. So let's worship. You're welcome to worship with your hands up, your hands down here, or just with your heart. This is worship.